Thank you, Minori. And, uh, yeah, I'm trying to find my timepiece. You don't have yours either? <laughs> it's usually my job, <laughs> is to keep track of the time. But actually, more than that, is to welcome Ajahn Brown and to welcome everybody here. It's a real honour to have Ajahn Brown with us, as usual. And it's the last weekend of his tour, so those who haven't uh, had the chance to practice with Ajahn yet, have the chance now. And uh, as Manori said, it's a wonderful opportunity to get some continuity in the practice. Sometimes we think a weekend's not long, but actually you can make every moment count. You can continue the practice in the walking periods, even back home, and just try and build up that momentum. So even two days can be very powerful if you know how to value it and use it well. So um, I would just like to uh, start by handing to Ajahn Brahm, who's going to lead a, uh, who's going to give a Dhamma talk and then lead us in some guided meditation. By then it will be lunchtime, so uh, if you can just let us go out first to receive our food. Um, just give us two seconds, basically. We'll be out of the door and you can uh, follow on. So yeah, thank you for your patience in advance because it's a, quite a big group. We had a lot of people still wanting to be here that um, we just didn't feel we could squeeze in, unfortunately, so you're really lucky. Um, so please be patient with the lunch queues and the tea queues and all of those things. It's all opportunities to practice kindfulness. So I'm going to hand over to Ajahn Brown. So thank you, Ajahn, for being here. And thank you. Do I need this one as well? I don't know. Yes. You do? You have to no. Have I don't. don't. Got this one here. And I've got so many microphones. Uh, and excellent. And also, I always remember... In the time of the Buddha, they never had any microphones. <laughs> <laughs> and he still managed to teach so many thousands of people. But nevertheless, microphones are helpful these days uh, because uh, these talks are all recorded. And because they're recorded, you can hear okay? Yeah, maybe the volume is not sufficient. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, no trouble. Can I also just say, because we forgot. Sorry, okay, go on. But no we trouble. forgot to welcome the live people that are watching live. Oh, yes. There's people watching live Bye. as well, so this is really cool. Yes. Um, and you're also welcome. Thank you. Excellent. That is one a wonderful part of modern technology, that you give a talk and it can be listened to all over the world, which is a wonderful thing to do. And not just listen to all over the world, but listen to some places where they would get into trouble if they were told the authorities they were listening to these talks. You know, sometimes in the question times, which I receive over in Perth, in Australia, sometimes you get people asking these questions from Iran or Saudi Arabia. And because it's on the internet, they can do that quite secretly without anybody knowing about it. And it's something which I kind of delight in, to make the Dhamma uh, free and open and available for as many people as you possibly can have. And that's one of the reasons why putting it on live, on internet, is a beautiful way of connecting with people so far away. And even when you feel that, why do people have to do that? Because they don't have Dhamma centers in some of these remote places in the world. And number two, even though it's the middle of the, actually middle of the night in some of these places, still they'd always get up early in the middle of the night in order to listen to a Dhamma talk, which is very helpful for them in their lives. And little things. I always like to keep my uh, Dhamma talks relevant. And it was very nice coming in here just about half an hour early, and finding a nice little corner just outside the door there, where I could hide. And of course, many of you saw me, you know where I was. But it wasn't that I was hiding from you, I was making sure you were hiding from me. I've done this many times, sometimes people feel they need absolute quiet in order to meditate. But I remember some teachings of Ajahn Chah who taught me that it's never the noise disturbs you, it's always you who disturb the noise. 
what that means is you can go and sit in a corner and you can kind of hear all oh, the people. <laughs> I thought you were bowing to me. <laughs> you can kind of you know, hear the noise of all of you chatting and talking and having cups of tea and coffee and stuff. But I always remember just to kind of build a, a bubble around me. And that's what I was doing in there. A nice little bubble, and just an imaginary bubble. And I'm on the inside, and you, including Ayachanda, are on the outside. So I can kind of hear you, but never be disturbed by you. So I had a wonderful little meditation out there. And you know, if you hadn't have, I did uh, condition myself, brainwash myself to say, if I hear your voice, then I will come out. Anybody else says no. And there's a beautiful thing you can do. There was this uh, Swiss monk at, uh, in Perth, and he asked me if his brother could come and visit from Switzerland. And I said, of course, you know, it's your family. Of course you can invite your brother to visit our monastery in Western Australia, but we have no spare accommodation. It's amazing in monasteries throughout the world, they get filled up so quickly, simply because it's a very attractive option to spend time just being quiet, peaceful, meditating, live a simple life for a few days. But anyway, he said, it doesn't matter. I grew up with my brother, so he, can he share my hut? And the hut which he was about to share was only three meters by 2.4 meters, the standard size in my monastery for huts. Are you trying to work it out in feet? What's that in feet? Three meters by... Yes, meters. Ten feet by six, seven feet. Ten feet by seven feet, something like that. Very good. Instead of thinking, I always know that somebody else will do the thinking for me. <laughs> but it's not that big. I said, well, you know, you're going to be almost laying next to each other. He said, it doesn't matter. We grow up together. It's my brother. But then I said, well, what would happen if he starts snoring? Sorry? What would happen <laughs> if he starts snoring? What would happen <laughs> if he starts snoring? Is that any better? Okay. <laughs> And he said, I've already figured that out. What I am going to do is make sure I go to sleep first. <laughs> if I go to sleep first, then he'll have to endure my snoring. <laughs> and won't be able to go to sleep. Okay. So he came, and the first night, when they shared the room together, I asked him in the morning, how did it go? And he said, Perfectly. Did you go to sleep first? He said, no. My brother fell asleep first, and as I, as I expected, he started snoring. Really loudly, in this small hut for monks. And I said, then what did you do? He said, I remember that teaching, it's not the noise disturbs you, it's you who disturb the noise. So what I did, when I was young, before I was a monk, I was into music. So I started imagining his snoring. At first, it was very awful and hard to bear. But after a few minutes, you can start to imagine it like this amazing modern music, which broke all conventions and challenged all stereotypes. <laughs> and he said it was amazing just how he could never predict the next uh, tone or chord. <laughs> And he said it was just like some experimental music, which he's sometimes heard in these uh, cafes in Switzerland. And after a while, it sounded so incredibly innovative and beautiful that he fell fast asleep. <laughs> in other words, instead of trying to uh, assume that snoring is disturbing, he changed the perception of that to something beautiful and something interesting and sonorous. And that's why that sent him to sleep. 
In the same way that I know many people have told me, when they can't go to sleep at night, they listen to one of my talks. <laughs> and to this day, I don't know whether that's a compliment <laughs> or that's a criticism. But nevertheless, I'm just happy that people can have a good night's sleep. Although a couple of times, one of the last time I was presenting at a conference in Berkeley, you know, the university in San Francisco, and then the MC invited me or introduced me. We're now very privileged to have Ajahn Brahm talk to us, and I know Ajahn Brahm very well, she said. I go to sleep with him every night. <laughs> And I thought, first of all, of calling a lawyer straight away. <laughs> I'm a good monk. <laughs> and then she said, by going to sleep with him, she listens to one of my talks every evening, and that calms her down for her busy day, so she can have a good night's sleep. But anyway, it's wonderful as a monk. I've been trained. years now, the last 50 years a monk, so I know what to do to meditate. It's not that hard to sit in a corner with many people looking at you, talking, saying all sorts of stuff, and then just totally ignoring you, and going in my little bubble and having some nice meditation. So don't ever think that you need to be in total physical silence to be silent within. Don't ever think that you need to be on a beautiful cushion to be able to get deep meditation. Don't ever think that you need to have so much uh, gizmos in front of you for the talks to work. <laughs> it's not the gizmos disturb you, or you disturb the gizmos. <laughs> But anyway, so how do you do this? How do you create the peace of meditation? It does help to have supporting conditions. But more than supporting conditions, it's your attitude of mind. Okay. More than supporting conditions is your attitude of mind. For your attitude of mind for your attitude, does that work? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I kind of enjoyed it. I'll do it. <laughs> I enjoy this much more. But can they hear overseas? Online? Yeah, yeah, they can hear. They can hear? Online, they can hear. Okay, great. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's okay to actually to, to just increase the volume of your voice. Sometimes you can connect much better with people when you haven't got a big a uh, lollipop in front of your, <laughs> your mouth. That's what it feels like. You feel like licking it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but how you create that peace and stillness, it's something you don't need perfect conditions. You're content with where you are, and you're content with what you're feeling. It's that contentment is one of the most important keys to being a skillful meditator. And contentment means just for the time you're sitting down with your eyes closed, you feel to yourself, this is good enough. And you're not fighting. You're not trying to make things different. Many years ago, you know, I used to be very uh, commonly going into uh, prisons to teach meditation. And I told this story, I think, last night even. The first... I'll just put my hand out here for when he's ready. He doesn't get tangled. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Uh, very good. <laughs> okay. This is now a talk in stereo. <laughs> a 
Oh, Matthias, poor Matthias. Anyway. <laughs> no, which channels the or distort? Distort? Yeah. No, the Dharma is never distorted. <laughs> is it? Depends who teaches. Okay. <laughs> Where was it? Sorry? Save the battery. Save the battery, okay. Um, what was I talking about? Prison. Oh, prison, yes. <laughs> That's what it feels like being a monk. <laughs> you can't do this, you can't do that, you've got to do what you're told. Get up in the morning when you get up in the morning. But anyhow, what I said last night, the very first time I went to teach prisoners in jail, that's when they asked me, is it really true? That through meditation, you can learn how to fly over walls. <laughs> they actually asked me that. I didn't make that up. When I told them it's very difficult to do, maybe it takes years and years and years of meditation. So the bubble of hope was popped. And the next time I came, went to that jail, only three uh, prisoners turned up. But you know, a lot of times, whenever you're teaching anything, you learn much more than anything you teach. When I went to that jail, many of those prisoners became really good friends. It's weird to say this, but once you go into a jail to teach, the people in the jail are always really honest. Basically, they've got nothing to defend. They've lost everything. They've got nothing to lose. They've lost everything. And so it had a kind of honesty, which is really rare in this world. Not only that, but the kindness. You know, I was obviously kind to each one of those prisoners. I never asked you know, what crime they were in there for. And you maybe have heard me say this before, that all those times, those years I visited prisons, I've never ever seen a murderer. I've never seen a thief. I've never seen a rapist. I've never seen a, a burglar. What I've ever seen is a person. A person who's made mistakes, usually early on in their life. Who's just hoping for some kind of respect to the good side of their character, so they can make amends. Weird thing to say this, but I trusted many of those people in jail. So much so, I remember there's one occasion I was uh, teaching in one of these top security jails in Perth and they had a series of rapes, guy on guy. And they said they got nothing to lose. They're in there for such a long time. So when I checked in at the entrance, the prison officers told me that I had to carry this pen, like a already biro pen. And they said, this is not really a pen. If you look at the ceiling, there are new, what looks like uh, fire alarms. They are not fire alarms, security devices. And if you get attacked, point your pen at one of those security devices, press the button on the top, we'll know where you are and we'll come and save you. They said, put it in your pocket. And I said, look at me. I don't have a pocket. <laughs> it's great fun being a monk because you really, <laughs> other people, they, you're not normal. So anyway, I said, I don't know how, I said, just carry it in your hand. So I carried it in my hand. And as soon as I went into my class, these prisoners, they took one look at me and said, oh, you've got one of those security devices as well, have you? I said, they told me it was top secret. Oh, yeah. <laughs> of course, everyone knew what was going on. And this guy, he was actually the same fellow who asked me, is it possible to levitate when you're meditating? He also, and he's in jail for a long time, <coughs> saw him for many years. And he said, do you think, Ajahn Brahm, that you can even think about pressing the button on the top of that pen 
before I jumped you and raped you. He was serious. And I said, no, you'd be much too fast. He said, yes. But he said, you don't have anything to worry about. You've been kind to us. So all these guys in the front here will protect you. If anyone in the back tries anything, they'll be in big trouble. And that was so true. Because I'd given a tiny bit of kindness to people who needed it so much, I felt as safe as I possibly could without any security devices at all. And that's the truth. So a lot of times with the meditation, you do gain a lot of insight into how to make friends, be protected, even in prisons. And many of you may not know this, but two of the monks now, over in Bodhinyana Monastery, were disciples we first met in prison. Prisoners who are now monks. One of these days I want to have bhikkhunis who were once in jail. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> so anyhow, but anyway, we can have lots of other real bhikkhunis first of all. They're all real bhikkhunis, real nuns. But that sort of kindness is accepting and open and inclusive, which is beautiful. So anyway, how we actually do that meditation, when we have a sense of contentment, it's amazing just how we don't want anything. When we don't want anything, we become still. When we become still and can stay in that stillness long enough, the peace builds and builds and builds. It gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Sometimes, uh, yes, I'm well known, I've got lots of disciples, but sometimes people don't trust me as much as some of these elder uh, Asian teachers like an Ajahn Chah. Ajahn Chah always used to say, using whatever visual aids he had living in a forest, he used to say, look at that bush or that tree. Look at the leaves on that tree and how they move. They only move because of the wind. If that wind stopped, the leaf would continue moving, but less and less and less. And if you are patient enough, you would eventually notice that leaf come to a complete natural stillness because the, the fundamental state of a leaf is to be still. It only moves because of something outside of it makes it move. These days we call it the default state of a leaf is to be still. It's the same as your mind. Its default state is stillness. It only moves because of wanting something. Not wanting is another form of wanting. When you want something, you disturb your mind. It's one of the reasons why when people come to a meditation retreat, they always feel they should have some goals. They, I don't know how much each one of you paid for this retreat, but when you go back, you think, well, I paid this amount of money, I need to get something back in return. What happens if you tell your friends you spent, how much is it, 200 bucks? Dollars? Pounds? Less. Really? <laughs> you made me come here for such a... <laughs> <laughs> My market value. <laughs> no, it doesn't matter. But, how much did you pay for a weekend? One hundred. One hundred and sixty. Okay, whoops, what happened there? Okay. The earth shook. The earth shook. Okay. <laughs> what would happen if at the end of this retreat you went back home and your partner said, what did you get for one sixty dollars? <laughs> Pounds. <laughs> 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 
What would, what, what would you say? If you said, I've got nothing, nothing. And they think, what a waste of time. But that's actually not how it really works. If you get peace, if you get joy, if you get stillness, that actually is the meaning. That's how nothing feels. We've all got so much stuff, we always have to preserve it, worry about it, clean it, make sure it's uh, preserved. Imagine if you had nothing. Imagine if when you go home you had no house, you had uh, no partner, no kids, no debts, and absolutely nothing. How would you feel? Cold. Cold. <laughs> a lot of time people don't understand what nothing means. One of the first time feeling cold, one of the first times I, I came as a monk to UK was they just opened up Chithurst Monastery in Sussex. And because I was a visitor, I had no duties. And it was in the middle of one of the coldest winters. It was minus 26 degrees, I think, outside. And maybe I was exaggerating, 16 or something. But anyway, <laughs> minus 16 is. They showed me the headlines in the newspaper the, the day before. This is UK. The newspaper said, even the beer froze. Yeah, that's what it's like. And you had to be very careful going to the toilet for urinate. Because even before the water hit the bottom, it was frozen. <laughs> that's cold. <laughs> that's what they said. I'm not sure if it was true. But I know that one of the monks made himself a cup of tea, hot tea, went to the toilet when he came back, and the tea is actually frozen. Frozen solid. That's where they invented iced tea. <laughs> Maybe I'm exaggerating again. But anyhow, <laughs> the, the reality was, the real story, was because I had no duties, I rugged up and went out into the forest in the morning. And when there was snow everywhere, all the roads were closed. Too dangerous to have any cars. All the airports had uh, closed or cancelled all the flights. It was too dangerous for landing and takeoff. All the birds in the sky were hibernating. All the animals which you usually see on the forest floor were also hibernating. And the only living being in that forest in that morning, they always say mad monks and Englishmen go out in the morning cold. And I was both. <laughs> the only person alive was me in that forest. Everybody else was snuggled away in their beds under their dunas in warm houses. And that was brilliant. Every time I stopped crunching the snow in my boots and stopped, it's like the whole universe stopped with me. It was quiet, silent. No distractions at all. I love that feeling of silence in what is a very noisy country like UK. And to this day, whenever I come across places of silence, I rejoice in them. It's one of the reasons why in Australia I live in a cave. It's, it's a monk-made cave. It's about, like imagine a hemisphere, about three meters diameter. And that's where I live. That's my home. And it's so quiet in there, you can't hear anything. I remember taking some school kids that were coming on a visit into that cave. And then afterwards I said, what do you think of that? This would be a great place for a rave. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. The peace and quiet was just so perfect in there. 
That's why the silence is something as a meditator I just love. And if it's a noisy place like this morning, I can still create that cave just by using the power of imagination of mind to create the silence and listen to that silence. It's just like, it's a very simple technique. When you come into this room, what do you notice? The people, ceiling, maybe the chandeliers, maybe the wall with all the pictures or photos on it. Have you ever realized the biggest thing in this room is the space between everything? The air, the space between you, is not what separates you, it's what connects you. Got all this wonderful nothingness around us. And I've got into the habit of noticing that when I come into a room. There's more space than there are people. Even though we may think this is jam-packed, the space is always there. And I've trained myself over all the years of being a monk to notice that space. It's a wonderful sense of freedom, a wonderful spa sense of space, a wonderful sense of emptiness. Even many people who say they can't stop thinking when they meditate. Yes, you can. You do it so often, only you don't notice it. No more than you notice the air which surrounds us. The spaces between your thoughts, the times when you aren't worrying about the past or anxious about the future. You haven't learned how to notice those places of silence in the mind. And when you do, you find that so much more free than all the things in the room, than all the ideas inside your head. Ideas are important the silence is even more important. We're in a university town. I went to the other place. I was told that's how I should speak about Cambridge when I'm in Oxford. <laughs> the other place. <laughs> but because I was there for many years, and I was, I was studying theoretical physics. Even went to the same lecturer who uh, taught Stephen Hawkins. And a lot of times I wondered, are thoughts necessary? How many people here are from Wales? Any Welsh people here? Oh, excellent. Nice to see you there. The, the only, up until recently anyway, the only Welsh man who got a Nobel Prize in Physics, got his Nobel Prize. He was studying uh, theoretical physics, quantum tunneling, and he meditated and meditated and meditated. When he came out of meditation, he knew the solution to a problem which eventually got him the Nobel Prize for Physics through meditating, through the stillness. It's one of the reasons why this whole retreat is about learning how to gain insight, to see deeper than other people through calming the mind and making it still. You don't get more insights by thinking, 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 thinking. You get it by seeing, 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 through stillness. That's actually how insight works. If you go thinking, and being logical, being reasonable, all you do is just repeat old ideas. You don't actually break new ground and see things in totally different ways. So anyway, when we have this stillness, this idea of contentment, when we don't want anything in the whole world, I actually did talk about the prisoners in jail. The one day, one of the prisoners asked, one of the other monks who took over the job from me. What's it like being a monk in Australia? Have you ever lived in one of the monasteries? Even for a short time? What's it like being a nun 
over here in UK. So he told the prisoners, monks get up early in the morning. I was up at four o'clock this morning. What about you? Five? Five. That's good enough. You were tired yesterday. I don't know. I've been getting up at four o'clock in the morning such a many years. I kind of, that's the time you get up. You try and have a sleep in a few times, but it just doesn't work. Anyway, I get up at four o'clock in the morning. And the prisoners in jail said, wow, even murderers don't have to get up that early. What bad karma did you monks do? And that's when I added, <laughs> it's optional. In my monastery, Bodhinyana in Perth, it's optional getting up at four o'clock in the morning. You can always get up earlier if you want to, <laughs> but not, not later. That's the only option. <laughs> then what do you do in the morning? Can you watch the late night movie? We don't have TVs in monasteries. And somebody tried that once. They, they came to our monastery with a big TV. They said, I want to offer it for you. We don't always accept things which people offer. <laughs> and I said, no, we don't have TVs. So, but I wanted to give you one. We'll give it to somebody else. I said, why did you buy it? This is a guy, he was a Burmese man. I bought it because it was on sale. <laughs> I can't understand that. <laughs> because it's cheap, they buy it, and then, then they think of what to do with it. <laughs> to me, if I have to need something before you get it. Anyway, so we don't have any TV. So what do you do in the morning? Meditate. After a while, you really enjoy meditation. You look forward to it. Something like peace and stillness and you feel really good. Sometimes it's even better than sleeping. The sleep can actually just give your body a rest, but when you meditate, your mind can really get a rest and really give it a boost. So, yeah, okay, so, okay, you're monks, I suppose, meditate in the morning. Then what do you have for breakfast? In those old days, actually, I had a big breakfast this morning. You know one of the things I had for breakfast this morning? It was out of compassion for others, it was baked beans. <laughs> and the reason I eat baked beans out of compassion for others is because uh, there was an article in the newspaper in Australia, the oldest man in Australia, he just finished his 110th birthday and he was still fit and active. And when they asked him, what's the secret of your good health and long life, he said, eating baked beans every morning. <laughs> and the Heinz Baked Bean Company, they actually made a special edition of Heinz Baked Beans. Instead of the usual uh, logo in the front, which is the same over here in UK, the one in Australia, they put his picture on the front with a whole, <laughs> whole big tray of baked beans. So I eat baked beans in the morning and this morning out of compassion. <laughs> so I can be healthy and live a long life. Not, it wasn't uh, self-compassion. Oh, no, I don't know. <laughs> That's what you talked about last time. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but we only can eat what, we, what we're given. Over in prisons, I don't know what it's like here in UK, but over in Australia, you can have a big feast at breakfast. If you're Singaporean, you can have some uh, noodles, some dumplings, <laughs> porridge. If you are English, you can probably have some bacon and eggs. If you are, where else? I forgot. <laughs> Sri Lankan. Yeah, you're Sri Lankan, you have some hoppers. Any Sri Lankans here? Yeah. What do you have for breakfast this morning? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Porridge. Porridge. Hoppers? String hoppers? Okay, anyway. <laughs> I'm trying to engage. <laughs> really, already? Yeah. Come on, let go. <laughs> let go. So, 
anyway, we live a very simple life, being monks. And they even ask, you know, can you play sports? I think I mentioned this to you already. The uh, uh, Buddhists are no good at sport. How did Sri Lanka do in the cricket this time? <laughs> it's not terrible, you did really well. I'm proud of you for a change. And the reason is because you were compassionate. You didn't bowl the, the ball too fast. Because if you caught a wicket, that would, that would be not compassionate to the opposition. And when you had an opportunity to catch the ball, you dropped it <laughs> on purpose. It was on purpose. Because <laughs> you let it go. That's Buddhist. You let go. Non attachment, not grasping. <laughs> So, <laughs> you're a good Buddhist, well done. <laughs> so anyway, the, so we live a very simple life. And the prisoners, the prisoners in this jail were just so disturbed that their monk, who they got to know and got to like and befriend, was uh, doing it more tough than any person in jail. Even beds. I sleep on the floor in my cave. I don't have a bed. I'm very happy like that. But they thought that was really tough. We only have two meals a day, breakfast and lunch. In prison, they have three or four meals a day. What a great choice. And they said, oh my goodness, that's terrible in your monastery. That's terrible there. And they said to this monk, you know, we like you. Why didn't you come and stay in here with us? <laughs> and they had a point, it's much more comfortable inside jail than it is in a Buddhist monastery. I tell you, you will not have to work so hard if we sent you to jail. <laughs> You'd only be able to have visiting time one hour a week. <laughs> Are you interested? <laughs> you said the so, bikini's from jail. Yeah, it'd be great. They won't leave. They like to stay there. They can watch the TV in, in jail, you know. No, don't watch the TV. Okay. But anyhow, it made me start contemplating what is the difference between being in prison and being free? It's nothing to do with how comfortable your lifestyle is. Nothing to do with how much you have, how much you eat, or any walls which surround you. The only difference between prison and freedom is whether you want to be here or whether you want to be somewhere else. All the people in jail want to be somewhere else. That's why it's called a prison. All the people in monasteries, they want to be there. No matter how ascetic it may be, how they can't get the food they really need or want. But they want to be there. And that makes it freedom for them. And that's an important part of meditation. When you sit down and close your eyes, ask yourself, do you want to be here? Or do you want to be somewhere else? If you want to be here, you find peace. No matter what here happens to be like. And you find a great insight about life. I don't know how many of you like going to work in the morning. Hands up if you like your job and look forward to going to work in the morning. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Fun as well. If you do, well done. But a lot of people, they go to work and oh crikey, why do I have to go here and do all this hard work with a tough boss? Am I a tough boss? No. <laughs> Are you even the boss? No. That explains a lot.
<laughs> Even if you are sick and your body gives you pain, are you happy to be here? Or do you want to get somewhere else? If you have a relationship with your partner, are you happy to be here? Or do you want to try and escape? That's a good description of suffering. Wanting to be somewhere you're not. Please don't do that with meditation. Doesn't matter how you're feeling. What is going on in your mind? Please change the attitude, I want to be here. If it's something which is unpleasant, want to be here. And you will find that undermines the feeling of unpleasantness. I've got to include this story now, even though, I, as always, I go over time. That's my tradition. <laughs> so, this was the story of the Empress. This Empress had a lovely palace. One evening, she went to listen, she went to go on a retreat run by Anukampa Bhikkhuni Project. <laughs> She was a really good follower and disciple of Ayachanda. And in the talk, she oh, learned so much, did this empress. So when she got back to her palace, she found that a big monster had gone into her palace while she was away. And this monster was huge, ugly, frightening, violent, and stench coming off the monster was something awful. But as soon as she came in, she knew exactly what to do. Because she went to the Buddhist temple. Even if it's big problems like monsters coming into your house, you understand exactly what to do. She looked at that monster, and even though it was so violent, so angry, and the stench coming off that monster was so bad, that even the maggots crawling on the monster's skin threw up. <laughs> Even made maggots sick. That's a really nasty smell. <laughs> and the language coming out of this monster's mouth was worse than you'd hear. Where's the roughest areas of, of London now? Uh, let's say Glasgow? The roughest, yeah. roughest areas of Glasgow on a Friday night after Scotland had been kicked out of the World Cup. <laughs> make, make any sense, but really bad. Bad language. <laughs> and the empress looked at that monster and said, Welcome. Thank you for dropping in, paying me a visit. Why have you waited such a long time? And then ordered some of her attendants. Go and get something to drink for the monster. I've been sitting there for a long time. Get something to eat. And then he asked the monster what it liked to drink. We have many types of tea. We have Earl Grey. <laughs> we have peppermint tree. Peppermint tea, okay. Peppermint tea is good for your health. <laughs> Do you like sugar in that? We have Dilma tea. Straight from Sri Lanka with tin kiwi. <laughs> what is it? Your favorite. What is tin kiwi? Condensed. Condensed. Yes. <laughs> You'll be well cultured. <laughs> what about something to eat? We've got many sandwiches. Or would you like a pizza? Because apparently you can get monster sized pizzas <laughs> from many pizza, <laughs> pizza huts. So they ordered beautiful food, beautiful drinks, and even some of the security guards were brave enough to give that monster a foot massage. <laughs> Needed about 20 of the security because his feet were so big. <laughs> and that monster enjoyed, have you ever had reflexology? Is it nice? So they gave this monster a foot massage. And this monster enjoyed every... It's very rare for a monster to get a foot massage. 
No, oh, yeah, just not too hard. Just a bit over there. Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. oh. <laughs> that wants to enjoy this foot massage. And every act of kindness, every word of kindness, every thought of kindness, the monster grew an inch smaller, less ugly, less violent, less smelly, less offensive. And soon that monster was back to the size when he first came into the palace. They never stopped with the kindness. I was so kind to this monster. One more act of kindness and the monster vanished completely away. That was adapted from a story, actually many adaptions, <laughs> but the core of the story is from the Yaka Samyutta, the anger-eating monster. It's one of the Buddha's stories. And it's such a beautiful story, the anger-eating monster, because whenever you have an experience, you're sick, you're tired, you're upset, and you say, get out of here, you don't belong. The feeling gets worse, the monster gets bigger, and more of a problem. A lot of time that's with human beings as well. That's why we have disharmony and wars. Get out of my country, you don't belong. They get worse. It's amazing if you say welcome, thank you for visiting me. They usually get so benign and kind and helpful. That's especially just in your meditation, any thoughts which you don't want. Please welcome them. And when you learn from them, then they don't come up again. If you try and get rid of them, they get stronger, more of a problem. That's what I mean by just being content. Whatever you're feeling right now, be kind to it. Welcome it. Thank you for coming to visit me, crazy thought. Then you take away its, its energy. It's not fed anymore by your negativity. And it soon vanishes all by itself. And you have this beautiful peace in your mind. All comes because you built that peace through ways of peace, through contentment. And you start to bliss out. That's what happens when the mind is peaceful. It's so much joy and happiness. It's one of the reasons why I love meditating. I'm attached to it. I've only got half an hour. I can stretch it out a bit. What's, what's afterwards? So, it's time to meditate. Okay. What's after meditation? Yeah, so I meant stretch it out yeah, a bit. Until 11 and then walking. Meditation. Walking? Do you want to walk? You. you can just lie down. Really? <laughs> I can't meditate. Gotcha. All right, okay. <laughs> okay, have a good stretch. Okay, so I'll guide the beginning of the meditation, maybe a quarter of an hour. And then once you sort of kind of set you in the correct direction, then I'll be quiet and let your meditation just carry on. Here we go. So when you're sitting down, please close your eyes and just ask yourself, are you happy to be here? If not, why not? Right now, you have nothing to do. You're not going to be judged. You're not going to have to fulfill anybody else's expectations. You're not going to get a certificate after this retreat. Just learn how to be with contentment. It does help to be kind. What kindness means, at the beginning of every meditation I do, I check my body, make sure my body is comfortable. It 
sometimes it feels comfortable. But then I ask, can I make you more comfortable, body? Sometimes I push my feet out, sitting on a chair is something I've only used, uh, recently got used to teaching meditation retreats. I usually sit on the floor. But sitting on a chair is fine. And I make sure, I, I actually love not wearing any socks, because I can feel the sensation of the carpet on my bare skin of my soles. It feels interesting. And I also make sure that the muscles above my feet are not subject to being tensed up. That my feet aren't too far away from the chair, they're not too close. And sometimes to find the optimum position, I'm prepared to experiment, to move it this way, that way, until I can find the optimum position for my feet on the chair. Sometimes I take five minutes doing that. It shows how much I care for my legs. And right now I can feel that my back is in a bad position, so I'm going to adjust my butt and sit properly. That feels so much better. If you prefer leaning back on the chair, fine. We'll find out what your body likes, most of all. I know that my butt can often ache. I make sure that there's no folds of cloth cutting into my skin. I try and make my butt as comfortable as I possibly can. But I do realize that there's always a feeling of the pressure of the body against the cushion underneath my butt. I want to make sure that's as even as possible. Because I know the feeling doesn't have to disappear, it just has to be even. And then it goes all by itself. And then I check my back. Sometimes it's nice to stretch the back. I've seen animals doing this in the forest throughout the whole world. Kangaroos do this over in the monastery where I live. The front paws against the tree and they stretch their back upwards. And then they let go. It relaxes and it feels really in a wonderful position. And then your shoulders. A great way to relax the shoulders is to scrunch them up first. Scrunch them up as much as you can and then let go. And they usually go to a position much more relaxed than when I started. It also teaches you what letting go means. Letting go means you're not stretching anything, squashing anything, extending any, everything. You're letting things just be in a comfortable, natural position. Then I also relax the insides. Starting from the bottom of my digestive tract. I just scan, like one of these modern machines, scan upwards. Checking on all those baked beans I ate this morning. They're all digesting well. We say, ah, my body is used to those. Scanning up the torso. Up to the stomach. Up to the lungs. Any females here, please also check your breast area. After a while, you get to know your body so well, you can know when there's anything unusual in those areas. Any tightness or tension. And then through kindness, you can relax anything. 
you can relax so much that any incipient cancer can be avoided. And eventually you get up to your throat, or actually down your arms first of all. How are your arms configured? Are they comfortable? Because I'm holding a microphone, I cannot put my arms and hands in the usual position on the lap. But right now they feel comfortable enough. But I check them first of all. They go to the throat. To make sure the head is well balanced on top of the neck. Then it takes a lot of pressure off the throat. And lastly, to the muscles around the eyes and the mouth and the nose. You can relax those muscles. Those muscles relaxing, a lot of emotions, negative emotions like fear, anxiety, ill will. By relaxing the feelings in the face, the emotions get softened, even to the point of disappearing. So by being aware and kind to my bodily feelings, the body relaxes and the mind relaxes too. And sometimes, often, I keep my awareness on my bodily feelings with kindness, what I called kindfulness. <coughs> until I can feel my body relaxing to the max. And I know it relaxes deeply when I can perceive the pleasure of relaxation. It's really fortunate to have an old body which can relax so deeply. When I can feel and sense that pleasure of relaxation, then the body always relaxes to a deeper level. I don't force this. I let go enough to let the body relax. And then I choose to relax the mind. Relaxing the mind by taking away all of the things which stretch it or squash it, like the past and the future. A lot of times we're burdened by all that happened to us in the past. The best way of solving the problems of the past is the simplest of all, to let it go. How do you let it go? By acknowledging it, being kind to it, having the wisdom to know you don't have to keep carrying it. The present moment is more important to you. And as for the future, now is where your future is being made. So if you want to be kind to yourself and have a positive future, put all that positive energy into this moment called now. It's the best way of ensuring a positive future. And to relax to the max. We have to come into this moment called now. 
the only time there ever is. And delight in the fact you are on a meditation retreat. It doesn't really get much better than this. So it's easy to be content, happy to be here. When we relax, we don't want anything in the whole world. The mind naturally becomes more and more still. If you can perceive something like your breathing, if you've done breath meditation before, Wonderful, but never hold the breath, just invite the breath in as a dear friend. Just one breath at a time. The meditation develops by itself. Your job is just to make sure you don't interfere. You just observe, just know, that's all. With contentment. And we'll be quiet until the end of the meditation period.
It is now 11 o'clock. You may carry on meditating if you wish. Or get up and do some walking meditation. Your lunch is in half an hour's time.